Uh, so in this video, we're going to just do a very brief look here at two aspects of life uh, amongst Jews uh, in um, first century Palestine. And so I'll just talk a little bit here about banquets and about books. Uh, so first of all, about banquets. Well, uh, banquets were really rare opportunities for social engagement. And uh, this is where you would uh, have time for you know, more kind of desirable foods and especially uh, the drinking of wine. So to sit at a table is quite a, uh, a much more kind of unique experience for mo what would be for most Jews living in Palestine. So you can eat, but you know everybody's eating every day, but the idea of sitting at a table is not a common regular uh, occurrence for most Jews. And so seeing scenes in, um, in the New Testament where people are sitting at a table or having a meal at a table, uh, these are rarer occasions, and usually they're much more uh, festival uh, occasions. So uh, all meals um, really in the ancient world had some kind of religious overtones. They're not really any such thing as just getting a bite to eat and not really thinking about or observing the fact that m the food that is provided um, is uh, provided really to give thanks to God for provisions. Um, and so uh, rec recognizing that foods, uh, having foods is really kind of the gifts, as it were, of the gods, um, or to recognize that the eating of this meal uh, or eating of a meal uh, together with others oftentimes uh, had some type of religious overtone with it. Uh, the, the meat uh, that was eaten would customarily have been connected to a sacrifice. So uh, again, meats would uh, eating of meats is not a regular part of the diet for the common uh, Jew um, for most agrarian workers. So meats are things that you would eat uh, on rare occasions or in connection with festivals. And usually meats then are oftentimes come uh, from uh, sacrifices. Of course, for, um, uh, for those involved in you know, pagan worship or those who are involved in the sacrifices of you know, uh, Gentile gods, uh, there are a lot more uh, altars to sacrifice foods and so um it's you know there's this kind of common connection with food with meats that are eaten for these special events and having those foods um you know being recognized or in somehow or another dedicated uh, to the gods uh, of the temples in which they could have been you know cooked uh jews uh would uh, only eat kosher foods at banquets, or at least that's what most Jews were only supposed to eat, is kosher foods. So kosher foods are um, clean foods, ceremonially clean foods, and there are certain foods that Jews uh, are, are prohibited from eating. So they're not supposed to be eating pork, they're not supposed to be eating you know, shellfish, um, and so um, they would try to stay away, or you know, more observant Jews would certainly be trying to stay away from foods that they thought violated um, uh, food laws and probably stay away from foods that uh, were uncustomary for uh, Jews to be identified eating. Uh, now, banquets also indicated a social acceptance. And so uh, people who sit at a table uh, with you are supposed to be people who share your common values. And this is probably one of the reasons why um, uh, the Pharisees become, you know, concerned when they see Jesus sitting with what the, who they perceive as sinners, uh, because Jesus' values as someone going around preaching uh, the repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand. Sitting with people who they perceive are not interested in law observance or not interested in in repentance seemed to them to be contradictory. So, what is it Jesus is doing when he is sitting at a table uh, with these people? Of course, Jesus does respond that. Uh, he recognizes that uh, sinners are um, needing repentance, but he thought that these, and just because he was eating with them, did not immediately indicate that he was condoning their uh, 
lack of law observance, uh, but he saw these occasions to eat meals as they have a, at least a sharing of an interest in the kingdom of God, and uh, so they are there uh, to listen to Jesus, most likely who is going to teach while at, uh, at the meal uh, or discuss things about God at the meal. So he sees these as occasions in which people have an interest um, in the coming kingdom of God. And so uh, these meal activities are, are used to kind of further the opportunities for them to be drawn into repentance. Uh, but there were uh, criticisms uh, that the rich uh, used these to emphasize their own social standings, and this is the case. Um, of course, in the ancient world, to try and acquire honor is an important uh, aspect of life, and one way you can acquire honor is by having people of a higher status with you come to uh, eat a meal uh, with you. That raises your status in the community, so if someone sees you eating with a person of a greater status, that raises your status or raises the impression that people would have of you. Or to be invited to someone's home uh, who has a higher status would raise your, um, raise the way in which you are viewed. Uh, voluntary associations, um, so organizations that existed, that people joined, um, you know, kind of for social gatherings, um, maybe they had the same kind of trade, same kind of interest, uh, and mystery religions. So these are uh, these organizations uh, centered around you know particular gods that have secrets that only those who are initiated into the religion will become exposed to. Um, uh, these types of groups used banquets and shared meals as the the moments for group identification. So for the early Christians. Uh, having this meal, the, the Lord's Supper uh, or communion, when they would gather together and eat a meal, of course, kind of you know around a table, um, and uh, this helps to reassert their shared values that those who are around the table have the, the common view about Jesus, God working through through Jesus, uh, and uh, the salvation that is offered uh, through Jesus's uh, sacrifice and uh, the kind of charge or commitment to uh, be prepared for his return uh, when they will eat the kind of eschatological meal in the age to come. Uh, so now I'll just talk a little bit about books um, in, uh, at this time uh, or li uh, literature uh, in general. So really only a minority of people in the ancient world could read. Now there's a lot of um, ongoing discussions and discoveries about literacy in the ancient world. Uh, but my current view right now is that, um, you know, uh, it would be uh, a minority of people who can have uh, an excessive uh, knowledge in the ability to read, read books. So we're talking the upper classes of people who know how to read. Um, scribes were used to write and uh, to read official documents since they would have the skills of, of learning how to read. Of course, in the ancient world, um, first century Palestine is primarily an oral culture. Uh, and as an oral, oral culture, the, uh, what is transmitted orally has a great deal of value. And books are seen as kind of secondary, trustworthy, which is quite different than uh, a kind of a modern world today where we tend to look at uh, written material as more reliable and unchangeable uh, and things that are passed down by word of mouth is much more susceptible. So, but in first century in Judaism, Palestine, um, people relied heavily on trustworthy people and their memory uh, who had information passed down to them, who, who memorized to some extent the, the essence of what was told to them and passed on, you know, reliably those kinds of information. Things that were written were thought to be things that can be manipulated. And so we have a very different view of literature and oral transmission than what we have uh, today. So scribes 
for these people, though, who did have the technical ability to write and to read. There were books on poetry, uh, books on satires, romances even, and adventures, uh, which were uh, quite popular uh, amongst the people who could read. Um, now, the library in Alexandria, uh, this is in Egypt, had uh, 7,000 rolls uh, in its uh, collection. So that's a mass massive amount of works. Uh, what's most important probably for Christians or students of the New Testament is that uh, the Septuagint, that is the Greek um, translation of the Hebrew Bible, um, was done uh, in Alexandria and probably for this uh, library. And of course, there were diff different uh, versions of the Septuagint that were developed later. Uh, but uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, was done for this library. Uh, and there's primarily two kinds of materials that were used to make books. Uh, papyrus, so papyrus is made from the papyri reed. Uh, and so this is a reed that grows particularly in, in Egypt. And you can harvest the reed from the waters. And then you can cut them and dry them and, and then weave them into kind of a material in which um, someone could write. Uh, the other is parchment, so it's kind of like uh, skin that uh, it is used, so not our, not our so much sense of paper uh, would have been used, but these other kinds of materials are the kind of the common materials that we find um, people are, are writing on uh, in the first century. Uh, and there are two forms in which books were composed, uh, were rolls and a codices. So rolls, so with like papyrus rolls, um, these are like scrolls, and so you uh, wind them up. Uh, now a codice is more like our book format. So this is where you have pieces of papyri or pieces of parchment, and they're kind of stacked one on top of the other. And so the codex uh, is a form of, of putting together uh, this material that is developing, is, is verging here at the end of the um, you know, first or beginning of the second century. And it's actually one of the forms that Christians um, got onto this new technology, uh, so to speak, uh, quite quickly. And so we find lots of New Testament manuscripts that were written uh, for a codex form and rather than the, uh, the papyri roll. You still have it on papyri, but it would be in a, a codex, a book form. And uh, <clears throat> there's also all kinds of literary, different literary forms that were used uh, for writing. Uh, I have here lives, or what's called a bios. Uh, and so we have our, our gospels are like a kind of life that was written. Plutarch was quite uh, as well known for have written lots of lives of different people. And so generally what is happening here is you're extolling the life of a particular person, kind of like a biography, but, um, but in these lives, the intent really is to draw people to admire the person who is being written about. So there's definitely an agenda. Uh, you're not really writing the life of someone that you hate or despise. You're primarily writing a life to um, for someone you want to emulate. And there are different kinds of histories that are written, but again, histories are, are written to extol certain uh, virtues and values that the author of the histories um, already holds. Uh, novels, you know, basically um, uh, fictitious stories or stories based upon uh, characters or individuals of the past, and letters um, are a type of literary form that was very popular and necessary for communications. Of course, you see Paul, um, who engages in letter writing um, at the, uh, in the first century as he tries to communicate to different churches. So just a few little aspects about books uh, that would have been uh, characteristic of Jews uh, living in Palestine and really living in the uh, diaspora uh, outside of Palestine uh, in the first century. Uh, Roman uh, world.